Okay. All right. So uh, yeah, uh, today I'm uh, I'm uh, introducing the speaker on behalf of uh, Benjamin, uh, who is traveling. Um, so it's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Chris Garten, um, who will be speaking on uh, non embeddability of uh, non abelian corner groups into a uh, get to one. All right, thanks for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak. So the title uh, is the statement of the main theorem that non-abelian Carnot groups don't by Lipschitz embed into L1. And this is based on joint work with Sylvester Erickson Beek, Enrico Ladona, Lisa Naples, and Sebastiano Nicolucci Golo. So here's the quick overview of what the talk is gonna look like. We'll spend a good amount of time doing background on Carnot groups. I'm not gonna assume that anybody in here knows what a Carnot group is. So I'll try to spend a good amount of time uh, getting some intu geometric intuition for what those things are. Then I'll talk about a, uh, a more well-known theorem about the non-embeddability into Bonnock spaces with the right Nicodine property, which will also let us see a little bit more of how their geometry works. And then from there, we'll transition to talking about uh, L1 targets and a famous theorem of Cheeger and Kleiner about the non-embeddability of the Heisenberg group into L1. And then we'll talk about uh, how to modify Cheeger Kleiner's argument and uh, also use a, uh, some important results from Ambrosio, Ambrosio Kleiner Ladona to, to get our main theorem. Okay, so uh, what are Carnot groups? Uh, I'll give you the technical definition in the next slide, but if you haven't seen it before, you might look at that technical definition and say, wow, this is a very uh, specific kind of object you're looking at. Why would you care about something like that? So what I want to talk about on this slide is just some motivation for where these things come from, where they show up in math kind of naturally before uh, giving you the technical stuff. So one important place, maybe the most in important, perhaps, is that Carnot groups show up as asymptotically cones of finitely generated groups of polynomial growth. So maybe you've heard of this famous theorem from geometric group theory before, called Gromov's theorem on groups of polynomial growth, which says that if you have a finitely generated group, and you look at its Cayley graph, and you look at um, uh, how fast uh, do the volume of balls in your Cayley graph grow with the radius? Volume being just counting the number of group elements in there, the number of vertices of your Cayley graph. If that thing grows like a polynomial, that growth function, the Gromov's theorem tells you that this group actually must be virtually nilpotent. Virtually nilpotent meaning that there's a finite index subgroup that's nilpotent. Nilpotent meaning that uh, after there is some fixed upper bound so that after finitely many commutators of that bound, you always get the identity element. Um, so a key step, like the first step in, in Gromov's proof is that if you look at an asymptotic cone of this Cayley graph, meaning that you kind of zoom out and you look at it from far away. So specifically you scale down the metric of your Cayley graph and take something like a Gromov Hausdorff limit or an ultra limit. Uh, the resulting object is going to be this nice continuous object called a Carnot group. They also show up in uh, Mostow's theorem for rigidity of locally symmetric spaces. So if uh, Mostow's, maybe you're familiar with uh, Mostow's rigidity theorem for hyperbolic manifolds of dimension three and larger, which says that if you have two closed uh, Riemannian manifolds with hyperbolic metrics, and the dimension is at least three. If their fundamental groups are isomorphic to each other, then actually already the, the, uh, the manifolds must be isometric. So you have some really, really, really weak assumption, something that's an assumption that only has to do with the homotopy class of the, uh, of the manifold. And the resulting thing that you get is that they're actually isometric, which is you know, as strong as an, of an equivalence as you can ask for. And Mostow's, uh, okay, that's for hyperbolic stuff. And then later on, he, he proved the generalization of that for more general uh, types of spaces called locally symmetric spaces. And so the, the, again, the first step here in his proof 
is you take something like uh, a quasi isometry of a uh, of a uh, between lattices and a um, non compact uh, symmetric space, and then if you look at the visual boundary of that space, you get something that is like a, a Carnot group. It's not any possible Carnot group, but it's one of these special uh, types of. It's a special type of um, uh, step two Carnot Carnot group. I'll define what I'll just talk about what the step is in the in the next slide. But anyways, again, the point is you take something, you take some discrete type of object, you look at the boundary of this thing, and now you and now you get a continuous object like a Carnot group, and then you can do some analysis there to to help you answer questions. And maybe the last place where they show up is as tangent spaces of sub-Ramanian manifolds. Nice, say nice sub-Ramanian manifold. So a sub-Ramanian manifold is like a manifold, a Ramanian manifold, but you can't move in every direction, kind of quote unquote. So a nice example of something like this is, say that you're driving a car in a two-dimensional plane. Then the configuration space of that car can be described by three coordinates. Two coordinates tells you where it is on the plane, and the third coordinate tells you what angle the car is at with respect to some reference angle. Now, by steering the wheel and by pressing on the on the accelerator, you can uh, you can you can take the car from any one configuration to any other configuration. But you can't always do it in a straight line, quote unquote. So if you want to turn your car around. 180 degrees, but without moving its position, you can't just do that by itself, right? You have to do like a three point turn or something. Uh, so this, these kind of geometries uh, where you have, say for this car example, you have a three dimensional configuration space, but you can only move in two directions. You only have control of two directions at once. And for the car, it would be steering the wheel and pressing the accelerator. That's a sub Ramanian manifold. And the Carnot groups are kind of the, uh, they're the building blocks of sub Ramanian manifolds in the same way that just Euclidean spaces are the building blocks of Ramanian manifolds. All right, now we'll only get into the technical definitions. So first I have to talk about Lie algebras. So a stratification of a Lie algebra is a vector space decomposition of that Lie algebra that satisfies this grading property. So that if you pick something out from GI and something from GJ and you look at their Lie bracket, you get something in I plus J. And then if you, and that's for I and J less than or equal to say uh, this S here. And if you pick out an I's and J so that if you, so that if you add them up and you get something bigger than S, then you just get zero. So these two things are, are saying that it's graded. And the last property is saying that G1 generates G as a Lie algebra. And so that's saying that anything that in G you can get as just doing some iterated brackets, Lie brackets of elements from G1. G1 is called the, uh, the horizontal layer of the Lie algebra. So the first two are saying that it's graded. The last thing is the, this bracket generating property is really what makes it a stratification. And okay, the highest, the highest component here that's non-zero is called the step of the, uh, the step of the Lie algebra. So just some observations, stratified Lie algebras are nilpotent. Nilpotent meaning if you do, uh, so in this case, if you do S, if you do S plus one or more uh, iterated Lie brackets, you just get zero. That's what nilpotent means. And this Lie algebra is abelian meaning that all of the brackets are trivial if and only if the whole thing is just the first layer. So it has step one. So uh, a famous example, um, well, okay. So example zero are just abelian Lie algebras. G is just some finite dimensional vector space and all the brackets are zero. So in that case, you just get G1 is all of G. The simplest um, non-abelian example is the Heisenberg algebra. And that is this three-dimensional algebra where in the first layer, the first layer is two-dimensional, the second layer is one-dimensional, and you have the bracket relation that X bracket Y gets you to Z and everything else is zero. And let me just uh, draw some more on here to maybe a nice visual for how you, how you can think of how to construct 
these types of algebras. Um, another, another simple algebra are things called the angle algebra or in higher, higher dimensions, um, filiform algebras. And these look like this. You can have say a Y1 and an X in the first layer G1. And then after that, everything is one dimensional. So you can say have Y2, Y3 and so on. This is in the second layer, this is in the third layer. And you could keep doing this up to N. And the bracket relations are that X bracket Y1 gets you to Y2, X bracket Y2 gets you up to Y3 and then so on. You can do X bracket YI will get you up to YI plus one. And all of the other brackets between these, these generators are just gonna be a zero. And this will define a Lie algebra and this grading here will be a stratification. Okay, so now we can talk about Carnot groups. So a Carnot group uh, of step S is a simply connected Lie group whose Lie algebra is a stratified Lie algebra of step S. So if you don't know, there's a basic theory and in, in, uh, there's a, it's a profound theorem, it's a deep theorem, but it's, a, it's fundamental to Lie group theory. And there's a correspondence between Lie algebras and simply connected Lie groups. So every Lie group, uh, and the correspondence is this. So the a Lie group, of course, is, is a manifold. So you can look at its tangent space at the identity. And then using the group operations, you can translate that tangent space around to get a left invariant vector field. And then just using the Lie bracket of vector fields, you get a, uh, you get a Lie algebra of left invariant vector fields. And so because of, um, well, you can think of this, the Lie algebra associated to a Lie group as both the tangent space of the identity and left invariant vector fields, because there's a correspondence to it. If you have something, if you have an element of the tangent space of the identity, you can translate it around using the translations to get something left invariant. And if you have something left invariant on the whole manifold, you can just evaluate it at the identity to get something back at the identity. So that tells you how to assign a Lie group, uh, a Lie algebra. Um, going the other way around, you can do as long, uh, and the correspondence is one to one uh, if you assume that the Lie group is simply connected. So, in other words, for every Lie algebra, there exists a unique simply connected Lie group whose Lie algebra is the one you started off with. <clears throat> okay. So now let's start talking about some of the special properties that Carnot groups uh, enjoy that other Lie groups don't. So one of them is this thing called uh, dilations. So because of this uh, grading decomposition, uh, if you have say a vector X in the Lie algebra and you decompose it into its components according to the grading X1 plus X2 up through XS, then you can define uh, this dilation map on it by multiplying, uh, well, x1 by t, x2 by t squared, and xs by t to the s. So that's obviously a linear map. And because of the um, grading property, this is also going to be a Lie algebra map. Meaning if you take this dilation applied to x, and you take this dilation applied to y, and you take the bracket of these two things, that's the same thing as the dilation applied to the bracket. <clears throat> and it's this grading property that, that makes this thing work out. Um, and okay, so that's, that's what the dilation, that's how the dilation acts on the Lie algebra. And then there's a, because of this correspondence that I was talking about, there's a, cor there's a corresponding group automorphism of the Carnot group whose action, when you, take the, uh, when you take the derivative of this map from the Carnot group to itself, then you just get this thing. I'll do, I'll do some concrete examples in a little bit. <clears throat> okay, so now we don't wanna just consider groups, but we wanna consider metric spaces. This is gonna be a talk about by Lipschitz embeddings, of course. So we say that a uh, 
left invariant metric on a Carnot group is homogeneous if it's homogeneous with respect to these dilations. So if you have X and Y and you dilate them by T, then it should dilate the metric by T. Uh, these things are uh, a left invariant homogeneous metric is uh, always exists and it's unique up to bilipid equivalence. And in fact, you can always find one that uh, that's a geodesic metric. And one way to do it is to construct these Carnot Carey Theodori metrics. I see I misspelled. Should be an open there, of course. <clears throat> okay, so maybe before I say any more, let's let's look at an example to try to ground things. So what about the Heisenberg group? So I said what the Heisenberg algebra was in the previous page. So what does the corresponding group look like to that algebra? After all, I just said that there was a correspondence between the group and the algebra. I didn't say how you find it. So let's look at a concrete example. So the Heisenberg group, it's gonna be three dimensional and the underlying manifold is just gonna be R3. And the group operation is gonna be defined this way. It's gonna have this polynomial group law. So in the first two components, X and Y, it's just the normal Euclidean addition, just the vector space group operation. And then in the last one, you also have this plus between the Z1 and the Z2, which also just looks like a vector space thing. But then you have this little twisting term in here that makes it non-commutative. So this thing is like the, uh, the scalar cross product or something between uh, X1, Y1 and X2, Y2. And of course that thing is not commuted. If you switch these two things around, that term is gonna flip with a negative sign. And so that's why you get a non-commutative group, a non-abelian group. <clears throat> and so the fact that we that our underlying manifold here is just R is just R n for some n, and the group operation is a polynomial group operation. That's not a coincidence. Every Carnot group can be realized concretely that way. It comes from the fact that the that it's simply connected and that it's nilpotent. That's those two facts basically tell you that you can always realize the Carnot groups concretely this way. Okay, so that's what the group structure of the Heisenberg group looks like. What about the dilations? The dilations on the group look like the same as they do on the algebra. You just scale the two horizontal components by T, just like you would in a vector space. But in the higher component, you have to scale by a higher power of T. In this case, it's T squared because you're looking at something in the second layer. And then what about the metric? So you can define a group norm on the Heisenberg group. This norm that I've written down here is the uh, Karani norm. And so what is it? This thing here you have, this is the fourth power of just the usual Euclidean norm of a, a vector in R2. And then we're raising it to the one fourth power on the outside. And then, but for the second layer here, it's not Z to the fourth, but it's Z squared. So that means that this thing scales differently, but it has to be scaled this way because if we want, okay, so then, sorry, well, once you have this norm, then you can define a left invariant metric the same way that you would in say a, a Bonnock space. You just look at uh, G1 inverse times G2 and take the norm as the distance between G1 and G2. So this, but back to, back to this norm, the scaling has to work that way because our dilations look like this, where Z is scaled with T squared, but we want the metric to be homogeneous with just a T on the outside here. So that means you should expect this thing in here to scale like, it should be like Z to the uh, one half. So this makes sense. So one way to think about these things or maybe a way that I would like to think about Carnot groups is something like a non-commutative normed vector space. Um, so the analog of just vector addition is the group operation. The analog of scalar multiplication is this dilations. And the analog of a norm is just a homogeneous group norm like this. Oh yes, and then one more important geometric uh, fact here is, of course, anytime you have a, a locally compact topological group, you you have a uh, a Haar Hausdorff, you have a Haar measure, and so for this model of the Heisenberg group, the Haar measure is just the usual big measure on R three. That makes stuff really simple. That's nice. But this measure scales differently because if you look at a ball of radius R centered at any point in the Heisenberg group and you look at its measure, it's going to scale like R to the fourth and not like R cubed. That comes again, you know, from, you can imagine why that is because we have these different, um, we have these different scalings here. 
So with this, with what you can get from this is that the Heisenberg group has Hausdorff dimension four. Although that since, since the underlying manifold is R3, the topological dimension is just three. So you have this mismatch between the topological dimension and the Hausdorff dimension. So that's already hinting at something like a, a fractal type nature of the Heisenberg group. Um, right. And yes, before I get to this slide, I wanna talk about one more thing over here. Um, so notice what happens if you look at this norm and you restrict it to a line that passes through the origin in uh, the xy plane. So if you're looking at a line passing through the origin of the xy plane, well, since you're in the xy plane, there's no z's. And <clears throat> um, if you're looking at two points, so if you're looking at these two points that are on the same line, then this thing vanishes. So what you're going to see is that the, the distance between two points on the same line passing through the origin in the xy plane is just the same as the Euclidean distance. So that means you have, you have a bunch of these lines and they, they're all, they all have finite length because you're just looking at the usual Euclidean distance of these lines. And in fact, I guess they'll, they'll be geodesics with respect to this metric. Okay, so here's another way how to describe what the metric looks like in terms of hinting more at what a geodesic metric would look like. So again, you have all of these lines uh, running through the origin in the xy plane, and they're all, they all have finite length, the same length as the usual Euclidean distance. But then since the metric is left invariant, you can translate these lines around using left translation, and they'll have the exact same length because it's left, the metric is left invariant. But because of the way the Heisenberg group multiplication works, when you translate them around, they can become really, they do become sh uh, sheared a lot and stretched out a lot with respect to the Euclidean metric. So like these blue lines over here on the right, they look really long with respect to the Euclidean metric, but they're actually, they're, they're all the same length as say um, something like this with respect to the Heisenberg metric. So if you wanna, if you wanna travel along a finite length path between two points that are vertically separated, say here to here, what you can do is travel along these left translates of those lines passing through the origin in the XY plane like I was talking about, and you can follow a path like this. And that looks like a really long path with respect to the Euclidean metric, but it's actually really short with respect to the Heisman group because these sheared things over here are actually short. And what you'll see is that if you look at two points, well, okay, we already saw it in the previous slide, but yeah, if you look at two points here that are separated, uh, whose coordinates are like, you know, zero comma Z, and this one is the origin zero comma zero, we'll see that the distance between these points is like the square root of Z. <clears throat> okay, so a uh, fundamental theorem about uh, the geometry of the Heisenberg group is that it doesn't buy Lipschitz embed into any R and T space. So the uh, the way the so essentially the hard part of this theorem is due to Ponsu from eighty nine, but the non embeddability well the extension uh, for R and T targets instead of just real value targets was realized later by Chigurh and Kleiner and Linauer. So the theorem is that anytime you have a Lipschitz map from a Carnot group into a Banach space with the Radonecker D property and you look at these difference quotients. So this is like forming a, a derivative in a Carnot group. This is like left translation by X and you scale the Y um, and you take that limit. So that's something like taking a derivative. What you get is a map over here that factors through the abelianization of the group. And if you have a non-abelian group, of course, then this abelianization is not injective. So what it's saying is that the derivative is not injective. But of course, if your original map was a bi lipschitz map, its derivative would also have to be by lipschitz map, which would have to be injective. So this says that, well, then the original map cannot be bi lipschitz if the group is not abelian. And just for, uh, for the Heisenberg group, the abelianization is just the map down onto the first two coordinates. So if you have x comma y comma z, that maps down just to x comma y. Okay. 
and there was a corollary I was talking about. There's no bilateral embeddability. I wasn't going to discuss the proof, but let's skip over that. Okay, so that was uh, that was a nice theorem about non-embeddability into RNP spaces. Um, now, what about targets that don't have RNP, like capital L of one? So there is actually some important uh, uh, applications of embeddability of metric spaces into L1 coming from stuff in theoretical computer science that I won't discuss. But um, it was conjectured by Leon Nauer that the Heisenberg group does not buy Lipschitz embed into L1. And note that we can't apply the previous theorem because L1 doesn't have RNP. So they were, they were thinking about this problem because of the applications to computer science. And so anyways, this problem, the answer is no, that the Heisenberg group doesn't. And it was uh, proven by uh, Cheeger and Kleiner in the same year. And now I'm gonna talk about uh, how, how they did it. How did Cheeger and Kleiner prove that the Heisenberg group doesn't embed into L1? So the first step is to understand what uh, metrics coming from L1 maps look like. So they have a general setup where you just have a metric measure space that has some nice structure like doubling and satisfies a, a weak Poincaré inequality. I don't wanna talk about all of that. I'll just say that this all applies to any Carnot group. So you have a Carnot group together with uh, its um, left invariant homogeneous metric that I had written down before. And then the measure is just hard measure. It'll satisfy a bunch of nice properties. Now some definitions, a cut of X is just a measurable subset, but modulo null sets. And these things are all, um, you can identify them via their characteristic function as elements of L1 loc, and then they get a Frechet topology coming from that identification. A cut measure is a positive measure supported on the space cut of X, which is just the space of all cuts together with this Frechet topology, and then you, and then you can talk about the Borel sets and Borel measures. So this cut measure should be, it should be a Borel measure and it should also satisfy some more properties that are not super important for me to get into. If you have a cut, uh, if you have a cut, you can get an elementary cut metric on X just by this formula. So this formula is just a, it's just a zero one valued metric. It says that the distance between two points is zero if they're, if they're both in the set E or they're both outside of the set E. But if they're on opposite sides of E, so one is inside and one is outside, then the distance is one. And if you have uh, a cut measure, you can integrate the cut metrics with respect to that cut measure. And then that thing is called a cut metric. So you should think of this as maybe in the literature, people talk about this as a, uh, this, cut, this cut metric is a superposition of elementary cut metrics. And Cheeger, Cheeger and Kleiner's theorem is that anytime you have a Lipschitz map from X into capital L1, uh, there exists a cut measure so that the pullback metric is the cut metric. So this pullback metric DF is the, just the pullback of F. So you look at F of X minus F of Y. So you look at the distance in the image and that's what this pullback metric means. So if you're familiar with nonlinear, if you're familiar with embeddings, uh, nonlinear, uh, Bionic space geometry and embeddings into LP spaces, you're probably familiar with this uh, cut cone decomposition of L1 metrics for finite metric spaces. And Chigir and Kleiner just proved an analog of that thing, but not for finite metric spaces, but for metric measure spaces. And instead of you know, a measure on a finite set, you have a measure on, uh, well, on this cut X. Um, but there's one more thing, and that if your metric measure space is nice, and your map is Lipschitz, you get some extra information. That is, if you integrate the, if you look at the perimeter measure of these sets E, and you integrate all of that with respect to the cut metric, then you get something finite. So uh, I don't know if I wanna give you the technical definition of what a, of what a uh, perimeter measure is, but um, you can probably imagine what it is in, uh, in Euclidean space. Right, so if you have some, say, nice set in Euclidean space, the perimeter measure, uh, let's say, let, let's let's say that this is some uh, open set in Rn, then the uh, the perimeter measure is going to be something like the Hausdorff uh, n minus one measure concentrated on the boundary of this thing. So 
you can make a you can make a a rigorous definition of this thing in metric measure spaces, um, basically the same way that you would in in Rn. And okay, since we have this property, this finite integral property, then this cut measure is called an FP cut measure. So this tells you that uh, sigma is not just any cut measure, but the support of sigma has to be on cuts whose perimeter is locally finite. Meaning if you just look at the perimeter inside of, inside of any ball of any radius, that thing has to be finite. So this tells you something about the structure of these, of these cut measures. <clears throat> okay, so then how do they use this to, to prove their theorem for the Heisenberg group? The idea is to study, just like for the RNP case, you study rescalings of the metric and see if you can extract some more regular structure by looking at these uh, blowing up rescalings. So if you rescale this cut metric, let's say representing your pullback metric F, so you rescale it like this, so which is which is like taking something like a like a metric derivative of this metric. Um, if the original map F is by ellipsis equivalent, then all of these things have to be by ellipsis equivalent to the original, to your, to your underlying metric with the same constant for the by ellipsis equivalence. So study, study these pullback metrics. And then also study the rescalings of, this, of the sets that have finite perimeter, because we know that that's where sigma is supported. So when we rescale a set of finite perimeter, what you're doing is you're looking at a point that say, in the boundary of the set of finite perimeter, and you're zooming in and you're looking really close at the set and thinking, what does its structure look like? So at the time that you and Kleiner are working on this, the second uh, question about the structure of these uh, blowups of these finite perimeter sets, they're already completely known for the Heisenberg group. If you have a finite perimeter set in the Heisenberg group, then for almost every point in the boundary, if you blow it up, you get a vertical half space. So what that means for the Heisenberg group is, okay, the Heisenberg group is like R3. It means you have a half space down in the XY plane and then just translate it up and down in the Z direction. So in other words, it's a half space in R2 and then you take its pre-image under the abelianization. That's what vertical half space means. Okay, so then the idea is, well, if you blow up these sets that our cut measure is supported on and these sets become vertical half spaces, then maybe this blow up metric here, these rescalings of the metric, maybe those should converge to something that's supported on a vertical half space. And that's exactly what Jigger and Kleiner proved. If you take these rescalings of the metric D sigma, then uh, as R goes to zero, you can always find another cut measure that is supported on vertical half spaces so that these rescaled metrics are approximated arbitrarily well in this L1 topology with respect to these vertical ones. And this is enough to get you non-embeddability. There's a little bit of work to be done here, but the idea is already clear here. Because uh, right, if your original map F is L by Lipschitz, then all of these things here have to be L by Lipschitz. <clears throat> um, but as R gets closer and closer to zero, these things look closer and closer, like these D -sig this D sigma tilde, which are supported on vertical half spaces. But think about it, if you have a, if sigma tilde is supported on a vertical half space and you pick two points that are vertically separated here and here, what is D sigma of these two points gonna be? If that's X and that's Y. D sigma, sorry, D sigma tilde. D sigma tilde of X comma Y is gonna have to be zero. Because if you look at these vertical half spaces and you look at the elementary cut metric uh, of a vertical half space on these two points, it's, gonna, it's just going to be zero because both X and Y have to be inside of the set or outside of the set. They can't cross over the set. And okay, so that's enough, that's enough to get you non-embeddability. In fact, it kind of says the same thing that the RMP theorem said for RMP targets. It says if you blow up your map F, then it should kind of factor through the abelianization all of the points uh, that are vertically separated should all, should all collapse together. So this is, you can, you can deduce that from this, from this theorem. <clears throat> okay, um, right. So uh, about their proof, uh, in their proof of this theorem, they only, they only use the specific fact, they only use the fact that you're working with the Heisenberg group once and that's to, to cite this theorem from Franke and Serapioni and Sarah Cassano that 
the blowups of finite perimeter sets are half spaces. That's, they, they just cite that once just directly. And that's the only time that they use it for the Heisenberg group. And so at the end of their paper, they, they kind of postulated that, uh, well, then our non-embeddability theorem will hold for any Carnot group that satisfies the same thing, that if you blow up finite perimeter sets, you get vertical half spaces. Um, however, that question is still open right now. I think they, they thought it was true. I think most people think that it is true, but it's still open. So that means that you cannot directly run the, this Cheeger and Kleiner argument to prove non-embeddability for Carnot groups, non-abelian Carnot groups into, into L1. <clears throat> uh, however, there was there is a, a paper from Ambrosio, Kleiner, and Ladona that gets some part of the way towards answering that opening that that open question, and that is that uh, for every Carnot group and for every set that has finite perimeter, if you look at a generic iterated blow up of E, then you do get a vertical half space. So let me let me explain that what that means. You take a set E that has finite perimeter, then for almost every point in the boundary, you can blow it up. You get some other you get some other space. Um, now for that, you some other space as in meaning some other subset of the Carnot group. Now you pick at almost every point in the boundary of that thing, you can pick it, blow it up, you get some other space. And then for almost every point in the boundary of that thing, you can pick that point, blow it up, and you get some other subset. And if you do that finitely many times, they have a bound in their paper that just, it just depends on the dimension of the group. If you do that finitely many times, uh, you will always end up with a vertical half space. But that's not good enough to, to run the Cheeger Kleiner proof because you really need to be able to do it just once. This iterated business is not going to work at just directly as is with Cheeger and Kleiner with their proof. Um, so the key idea to the Ambrosio Kleiner Ladona theorem is the intermediate result is that every time you blow up the set E, so every time you do this iterated blow up, you gain an invariant direction. So a vertical half space is one where, I guess I defined what it was for the Heisenberg group, but for a general, for a general Carnot group, it means the same thing. It means you take a half space in the abelianization and you look at its pre-image under the abelianization map. That's what a vertical half space means. And <clears throat> so in particular, vertical half spaces, they're always invariant in any direction uh, that's in the commutator subgroup of the group which specifically, okay, so you, you can probably imagine what invariant means for Euclidean space, but for what does it mean for a Carnot group? So invariant in a direction means that if you, if you look at the flow along that left invariant vector field, the set stays the same. The set is invariant under that flow. So, um, so yes, what they proved is that every time you blow up E, you get an extra direction that that uh, in an extra invariant direction, an extra direction that E is invariant in. So that means if you just do it enough times, you just exhaust everything and eventually become as invariant as possible. And then you have to be a, a vertical half space. That's essentially their argument. Okay, so that looks pretty promising. So then our idea was, all right, how can we modify Cheer Kleiner's argument so that we can incorporate uh, this lemma from Ambrosio, Kleiner and Ladona to get, to get non-embeddability for general groups. So here is how we modified it. Um, so in red, what I've highlighted are the differences between our theorem and the Cheeger-Kleiner theorem. So our theorem says that uh, if sigma is a FP cut measure supported on some special class of sets E, um, and then you have some other collection of sets F, so that F contains the generic blowups of E, meaning that if you pick a, a, a cut out of E, a set out of E, then uh, for almost every point on that boundary, all of the blowups should belong to script F. So if you have something with that property, then for almost every X in the group, uh, the same exact limit holds as before for Cheeger and Kleiner. These rescaled metrics are approximated arbitrarily well but now the only difference here is that for Cheeger and Kleiner, the script F down here was half spaces and they were able to use half spaces because they know that if you blow up a finite perimeter set, 
in the Heisenberg group, it becomes a half space. For us, we don't know what it is. We just, we just say that, well, it's just script F, where script F is something that contains the generic blowups of E. That's basically it. And then you change, okay, and before, of course, for Trigger and Kleiner, they have the Heisenberg group, but here we have any Carnot group. And the proof of this theorem is uh, very, very close to the, for, to the Cheeger, and, Cheeger and Kleiner's theorem. Okay, so here's a restatement of the theorem. Um, I just wanted to emphasize the important things here. Sigma is supported on sets in script E and F contains these generic blowups of E. Okay, and then the next thing that we had to, to do that uh, Cheeger and Kleiner didn't have to do is that we want to iterate the procedure, right? We want to, we, we want to keep doing iter, iterated blobs. So we actually have to take this, we actually have to take this limit and produce a, a blow up metric. So our next theorem is that under the same hypotheses, then you can actually find a sigma tilde supported on F so that this limit of these rescalings actually equals that sigma tilde. So here we don't have that because this one just says that you're infing over these sigma tildes. So it, you know, it could be a different sigma tilde depending on your scale. But it's not too hard to imagine how to get this. Um, you just have to set up the problem correctly so that you can use some type of weak star compactness to, uh, to get some subsequential, this, that's what this main thing, the sub here means, like subsequential. So you can look at some subsequential limit to get this d sigma tilde. Okay. And then if we use this theorem B and we apply it iteratively and we use uh, the Ambrosio uh, Kleiner-Ladona method uh, uh, theorem, the, then we can get that if we iterate this procedure, then we can get an iterated blow up metric that is supported on half spaces. So I was gonna go through the proof, but I'll just say that I think it's fairly clear from here. So you apply theorem B iteratively to say that Okay, you blow up. So then if you were originally supported on E, now you're supported on F. Then you blow up again. So then if you were, once that thing is supported on F, then, you, then when you blow up the metric, you'll be supported on the next blow up. And you can keep doing this. And then what, what you get is that these metrics, uh, D sigma N, they'll be supported on cuts that have more and more invariant directions. Remember that key lemma from here. It says every time you blow up, you gain an invariant direction. Oops, it's not what I meant to do. You gain an invariant direction. So we use that together with our theorem B to get this theorem C. And this is, uh, yeah, that's the, that's the argument. Do I have the corollary? Right. The corollary is that, okay, this is enough to get to non-embeddability. Because if your original Carnot group did have a bio Lipschitz embedding into L1, then all of the all of these iterated blowups, all of these, in particular this one, it would it would also have to be bio Lipschitz equivalent with respect to the uh, the metric on your group. But since it's equal to something supported on vertical half spaces, well then it's not bio Lipschitz equivalent because this d sigma tilde it's going to assign a distance zero to any things that are vertically separated that is separated by an element in the commutator subgroup. Okay, so that's how you, that's how you prove non-embeddability. That's, that's how you get our main theorem. In the last five minutes, I, I wanted to quickly uh, describe what, the, what uh, some of the ideas for the key points here are. So I think the key, the key uh, lemma, uh, probably if you were following as you could guess is this one by Ambrosio, Kierkeim, and Ladona. Sorry, Ambrosio, Kleiner, and Ladona. Every time you blow up a set uh, E, you get an extra invariant direction. That's the, that's the key thing that's going on here. So how, how does that happen? Why does it happen? Um, yeah. So I'm gonna give you a really brief sketch. Okay, we have four minutes left. So suppose you have a cut and then you have this left invariant vector field uh, in the Lie algebra. We say that this cut is X invariant, so it's invariant in the X direction if this distributional derivative is zero. So you should think of this as saying, if this thing, if this one sub E here was like a smooth function, 
and you take it, you take the derivative with respect to some vector field X, you know, that's like saying, you know, you, it doesn't change along this line. So, excuse me, this is the same thing as saying that if you flow the set E in the direction of X, uh, the set E stays the same. Um, so that means that's X invariant. X regular means uh, that the, this directional derivative in the direction of X of your characteristic function set E, maybe it's not zero, so maybe it's not invariant, but it has some amount of regularity. So it's, it's a radon measure. So these, again, these derivatives are in the sense of a, a distributional sense. So this thing could be could be a write-on measure, and then there's this other <coughs> excuse me important notion uh, that a set E has a constant horizontal normal. So what that means is that if you look at um, if you look at your horizontal layer G one, let's say just for example, let's say that your G one is two dimensional, and I'm drawing it in this plane. Then if you, once you fix, if you fix an inner product on G1, then there is this vector nu so that your set E, so this, this here thing, this maybe should say uh, nu of one sub E. It says that if you're looking in the direction of V, one sub E is always increasing in the direction of E, which means that if you're, if you're looking at flow lines in the direction of uh, nu, these things are always, if you started, if you started inside of E, you always remain inside of E when you flow this way. And if you look at directions in the horizontal layer that are orthogonal to nu, then it should be invariant in that direction. So there should be no change at all in that direction. So if you're thinking about uh, your Carnot group just being Euclidean space, then the, uh, the only examples of these things are just half spaces in Euclidean space, where the normal to the half space is this normal nu. So that's the example you should be thinking of. For Carnot groups, these things are more complicated, um, but they they just have this same, you just ask for the same property that you have for half spaces in, uh, in Euclidean space. Okay, so here is how that uh, Franke and Serpioni and Sierra Cassano prove their theorem about blowups of finite perimeter sets in the Heisenberg group being vertical half spaces. They prove that if you have a finite perimeter set and you look at a generic blowup, then it'll become a constant normal set. And they in their proof, that proof works for any Carnot group. It's pretty, it's, it's fairly simple. And then from there, you use some algebraic properties of the Heisenberg group to conclude that constant normal sets must be vertical half spaces. It's the same, it's basically the same argument that the same outline of an argument that you would use for Euclidean space. If you had a finite perimeter set and just a Euclidean space and you wanted to prove that a generic blow up on the boundary is a half space, you'd kind of prove it the same way. You'd prove first that it has constant normal and then constant normal sets have to be half spaces. So for the, for the Heisenberg group, the proof follows that same outline. Now what Ambrosio and Kleiner and Lodone proved is that if you have a constant normal set and it's not already a vertical, if it's not already a vertical half space, then you can, what you can do is use this, use this uh, fact that G1 generates the whole Lie algebra so G1 is, does G1 here, that this is, this is the layer that, that we care about for constant horizontal normals, um, right? So just to emphasize here, this property of having a constant horizontal normal, it doesn't say anything about directional derivatives and directions that are not horizontal, not in the first layer. But if you know this fact, and you also know that G1 generates the whole Lie algebra, which it does because that's the definition for Carnot groups, then you can use some nice algebraic <coughs> techniques to prove that you can always find an extra regular direction with no horizontal component. So what it means is you can look at, look at all of the regular directions that you have, that your set has, you can always find uh, uh, another one that has no horizontal component. And then their second lemma, I can barely fit on here, is that if you have this extra regular direction without a horizontal with no horizontal component, you can blow it up at a generic point, or sorry, blow up, blow up the set E uh, at a generic point. And then this direction, uh, this direction X, that was, that was a regular direction, it will almost become an invariant direction. So X itself doesn't become an invariant direction, but some homogeneous component of it does become an invariant direction. And this invariant direction Z will be an invariant direction that E did not already have. 
And so then you just kind of, uh, you have this feedback loop that, that, that goes on. Every time you have a constant normal set, you can always find this extra horizontal, uh, sorry, you can always find this extra uh, regular direction. Then you blow up and then you can extract an extra invariant direction that you didn't have. And then you can kind of repeat the process and say, find a new uh, regular direction, blow it up. You get a new invariant direction and so on. And you can just keep repeating that process until you are as invariant as possible, which means that you're a vertical half space. And, and okay, so that's, that's, the, that's the key thing here. And that is the end of the talk. So thank you for your attention. All right, thank you, uh, Chris, for a, a very nice talk. Um, are there any questions or comments? So maybe an obvious question is, um, I mean, have you tried to, uh, to uh, look at the quantitative statements for? Uh... Yeah, that's, uh, we have not looked. I think we, right. So yeah, just for a little, a little his, history stuff here. Um, so Cheeger and Kleiner, after they proved their first, their first proof for the non-embeddability of the Heisenberg group to L1 using these blow up methods, then I think them two together with uh, Naur, I think it was those three, tried to uh, prove some quantitative version of that. And they were able to get some quantitative non-embeddability theorems, but they weren't sharp at all. And then later on, uh, Naur and Young have you know, a very long and very deep paper that gets the correct quantitative non-embeddability. So if we wanted to, yeah, so you could, you could try to take these all, 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 since we have iter since we have to do it iteratively and not just once, I think that already seems like you're, that uh, you're not going to be able to follow the same route, at least for, for their first paper, for like the Cheeger and Kleiner and our paper, since we have to do an iterated thing. It's not really going to lend itself at all to, to a quantitative argument. But then the second thing, like the now or young, you would have to understand like quantitative rectifiability of uh, Carnot groups. That would be, I mean, that would be a, a very, uh, that would be a big challenge to study that. So uh, I think other people have thought about quantitative non-embeddability in Carnot groups, people that are specifically kind of in that area. We have not thought about it at all. I don't, yeah, I'm not sure if we have plans to do that. Other questions? There's a question in the chat. Comments. So if there are no further questions, so let's uh, thank uh, Chris again.